because Putin is a political animal who can sense fear. Uh, to, uh, and when he does, he becomes more aggressive. If he sees the strength, if he senses the strength, uh, as it was recently demonstrated by, as the one recently demonstrated by the Congress, he will be forced to step back. This is my video update on this Monday, midday, April the 29th. Let's talk about some news. And that was Ukraine's foreign minister, Kalua Kuleba, speaking with very sophisticated journalist and international correspondent, Christian Amanpour, on CNN and Ukraine's foreign minister. He said that Putin is a political animal that can smell fear. Jerry, do you know that the human head weighs eight pounds? Jerry, do you know that bees and dogs smell fear? <laughs> oh, man. So, Mark Rutte, he said a couple of weeks ago that the collective West should not fear Putin. And then, Alensky... After Mark Rutte's statement, Alensky, he also said that the collective West should not fear Putin. I talked about this in my video updates from Athens about a week ago. And now we have Kuleba telling very sophisticated journalist and international correspondent Christian Amanpour, telling Amanpour that... Putin is a political animal that smells fear. <laughs> Kuleba said that Putin would run away at the sight of mighty NATO. And uh, Kuleba also said that he's very happy to have the U.S.'s support, the $61 billion from the U.S. It's good to have America back with Ukraine, but Kaluba also said that uh, he does not see any Patriot air defense systems, and that's a bit troubling for Kuleba. So Ukraine, they need more money. Ukraine needs more money, and yesterday we got Alensky's video address where he revealed that he is negotiating with the United States in order to secure 10 years of American payments to Ukraine. Alensky said, and I quote, We are working to commit to paper concrete levels of support for this year and for the next 10 years. It will include military, financial, and political support. As well, as, as well as what concerns joint production of weapons. Uh, joint production of weapons. That's right. Ukraine is going to be the Silicon Valley of weapons manufacturing. Ten years of U.S. support, U.S. payments to Ukraine. Ten Years. That is what Alensky says he is negotiating with the Biden White House, if you believe what Alensky is saying. David Sachs, he tweeted, Alensky announces that Ukraine is working on a security agreement with the U.S. that will fix levels of support for the next 10 years. The $61 billion was just the beginning. The next two U.S. presidents won't be able to switch it off. And Elon Musk, he replied to David Sachs saying, this is insane, the forever war. Didn't Julian Assange say that the goal of, of U.S. wars was to make them forever wars? I think Julian Assange said something like that. The goal of war is to make them forever war or endless wars. But uh, the 10-year the funding will be... President proof. I agree with David Sachs's tweet. Whatever, whatever negotiations are taking place, and I believe there are negotiations taking place with the Biden White House, the goal is to make it so that 
whoever is president, they will be unable to turn off the funding to Ukraine. If they turn off the funding to Ukraine, then they would risk impeachment. That is, that is the mechanism that I believe they're trying to put in place. Ten years of U.S. funding for Ukraine. So Reuters, they put out an article with the title, Ukraine's 61 billion lifeline is not enough. It is not enough. We are one week removed from the approval of the 61 billion to Ukraine. And Reuters is coming out with an article saying, yeah, the 61 billion not going to be enough. (laughs) It is not going to be enough, according to Reuters. Unbelievable, huh? One week from the House vote to approve the $61 and now they're telling us that Ukraine needs more. And what is that more? Well, that more is in the form of the $300 according to Reuters, $320 U.S. dollars of Russian frozen assets that is mostly being held in Europe at Euroclear in Brussels. That is the more. The more money can come from the $320 billion in Russian frozen assets. And the way to get that $320 billion in Russian frozen assets to Ukraine is through what Reuters is describing as a syndicated reparation loan. Got that? A syndicated reparation loan. So let me, let me summarize what Reuters is reporting. The 61 billion, according to Reuters, is enough to get Ukraine to the November 2024 election. Quote, the latest U.S. package should see Kiev through to about the end of next year. Reuters is then saying that Ukraine needs a medium-term funding plan. Ukraine could run out of weapons again in late 2025. A multi-year funding plan has the following benefits, according to Reuters. It acts as insurance against U.S. political swings, president proof. It may boost Ukraine's morale, the military's morale. It gives the the military-industrial complex confidence to manufacture more weapons because it's a long-term funding plan. According to Reuters, this may also change Putin's calculation. If he sees that there's a long-term funding plan in place, then Putin may decide to come to the negotiating table because he will see that the collective West is committed to Project Ukraine. And according to Reuters, the benefits of a multi-year funding plan is that this may lead to a freeze in the conflict or worst case scenario, this will lead to a freeze in the conflict, something along the lines of North and South Korea. So Reuters is saying that Ukraine will need at least 88 billion euros every year in long-term assistance and long-term funding capitalizing interest payments of 320 billion with a bond backed by future interest rates and paying the proceeds to Ukraine might raise 30 to 40 billion euros it will not be a game changer because it will fund Ukraine for less than half a year this is in reference to to utilizing the interest of the 300 billion and giving that interest to Ukraine over over the long term it could probably give Ukraine around 30 to 40 billion but obviously that's not enough if what Ukraine needs is 88 billion every year so the main way to get money to Ukraine is the 320 billion dollars in Russian frozen assets quote that would finance the war at least 
until at least the end of 2028. Now, here is the important part of the Reuters article. The $320 billion can be given to Ukraine as a syndicated reparation loan. Ukraine would pledge its claim for reparations against Russia to a syndicate of its allies in return for a loan. If Moscow refused to pay the damages, which it would, the Allies could use Russia's frozen assets to pay off the loan. Do we understand the plan here? What, what a syndicated reparation loan is all about? Ukraine going to the collective West, the G7, the European Union, and, uh, and Canada, Australia, New Zealand, going to the collective West and saying that Russia owes us 400 billion in reparations and the collective West saying, okay, well, we'll give you 320 billion against the, the damages that Russia owes you as a loan. And we're going to go to Russia and say, Hey, Russia pay back the loan. We've just given Ukraine in reparations in damages and of course Russia's going to <laughs> laugh at this and they're going to refuse this but there you have it that's that's the the syndicated reparation loan scheme according to Reuters that's how they're going to get the 320 billion in Russian frozen assets to Ukraine and it is all freaking illegal this is all mafia tactics illegal Schemes, <laughs> plots, schemes, plans, call it whatever you want. This is all freaking illegal. And this is going to lead to a financial meltdown, especially in Europe and also in the United States. This is going to completely demolish trust in the collective West financial architecture. Reuters also says towards the end of this article that this in no way prejudges a much bigger funding package later. In other words, once they burn through the $320 billion, then, uh, <laughs> then more, more loans and more money should be given to Project Ukraine. Basically, the money's never going to stop for Project Ukraine. And now you understand why the political class in the U.S. House why they were waving around their Ukraine flags, their little Ukraine flags, and screaming, Slava, Slava, Slava. <laughs> now you understand why, because the plan is for long-term payments, long-term money going to Project Ukraine. Keep the grift going for at least 10 years. That's why they were so happy. Anyway, we are getting... Reports, rumors that the, the collective West, Ukraine, they are scheming, plotting a big attack against the Crimea Bridge. Yesterday, I talked about a tweet from the Ukraine, from the Lithuanian ambassador to Sweden, talking about the Crimea Bridge and how if you haven't taken a photo of the Crimea Bridge, you better take one, hinting at some sort of Ukraine collective West attack on the Crimea Bridge, destroying the Crimea Bridge. And it looks like the Lithuanian ambassador to Sweden, maybe he overheard the Lithuanian foreign minister talking about, this is just a guess, talking about some sort of plot or scheme from the collective West, from the U.S., the U.K., um, the EU, I don't know, to, to launch some big attack, France, to launch some big attack against the Crimea Bridge. And Peskov, in an interview the other day, he said that the West is testing Russia for weaknesses, for military weaknesses and looking for, for spots where, where they can attack Russia and do damage to Russia and Alexander he talked about this in his video update yesterday how the main target 
is looking like the Crimea bridge. Maybe this is Newland's nasty or nice surprise that she was talking about before she decided to go teach at Columbia University. And Alexander, he talked about this in his video update from yesterday, mentioning how the Biden White House was probably waiting for Germany to deliver the Taurus missiles to Ukraine. So it would be the Taurus missiles that would go after the Kerch Bridge. But the Biden White House got tired of waiting for Germany to, to deliver the Taurus missiles to Ukraine. Remember the, the audio leak of the German military officials talking about Taurus missiles destroying the Kerch Bridge. Anyway, the Biden White House, they said, you know what, we're tired of, of waiting for Germany to make a decision on the Taurus missiles. Let's go with the attackums. And the, the best time to go after the, the Crimea Bridge would be the first half of May, because you have Orthodox Easter, a very important holiday for for Russian Orthodox, for, for all, all Orthodox uh, Christians. That is uh, this, this week and the first few days of May. So that's a very important date on the Russian Orthodox calendar. You have Putin's inauguration, which is taking place, I believe it's May 7th, is when Putin is going to be inaugurated as president of the Russian Federation. And then you have the Victory Day celebrations. So an important first half of events in May for Russia. And if you wanted to, to go after the Kerch Bridge, and a good time to go after the Kerch Bridge in order to try to humiliate Putin and to humiliate Russia would be this first half of May. So Peskov, it looks like Peskov, that's what he was hinting at in the interview that he gave the other day, how the West is trying to, to search for weaknesses and to go after weaknesses uh, inside Russia. And the timing lines up so that A probable possible attack of the Kerch Bridge will be tried during the first half of May. And of course, the goal, the thinking, I imagine the thinking in the collective West by the neocons is that if, if they can hit the, the Kerch Bridge and destroy the, the bridge at the right time, then perhaps, probably, you can humiliate Putin enough so that it does enough damage to his administration and maybe you can start getting some momentum going for a possible uh, regime change in, in Russia. I'm, I, I'm positive that the neocons are, are thinking along these lines. And once again, Newland promised some nasty or nice surprises awaiting Russia. I'm 100% convinced that that the nasty surprise is the destruction of the Kerch Bridge. And then, of course, we had the Twitter X post from the Lithuanian ambassador to Sweden, which hints at him being told something by someone at the foreign ministry connected to the destruction of the Kerch Bridge. They're fixated, absolutely fixated. The neocons, the collective West, Ukraine, they are absolutely fixated on the destruction of the Kerch Bridge, which, as I said in my video update yesterday, is a civilian target. We are talking about destroying civilian infrastructure. But to the collective West, they are 100% convinced that if they can completely destroy the Kerch Bridge, then they have a chance to destroy Putin. That's, 
That's the thinking, in my opinion. Anyway, let's move on to the other war that the Biden White House is happily funding. And that is the war in Gaza. And it looks like Israel is preparing an attack on Rafah. Yesterday, if, uh, if I got it right, if my reporting is right, yesterday, Israel, they bombed a food camp in Rafah. But over the past couple of days, Israel has been bombing Rafah most likely to, to soften up uh, Rafa and various targets in Rafa so that this invasion, this incursion into Rafa can take place. The reports are that the Netanyahu administration, they are giving Hamas one final chance to avoid an incursion into Rafa if Hamas releases Israeli hostages. And yesterday, we had Mahmoud Abbas plead with the United States to speak with Netanyahu and to try and prevent an Israeli offensive into Rafah. Palestinian leader appeals to U.S. to stop Israel's Rafah offensive. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas says the U.S. is the only country that could stop Israel from attacking Rafah, the southern Gaza city where more than a million people are taking refuge. And Reuters reported yesterday that Biden called Netanyahu and that Biden, he made the U.S.'s position clear on Rafah. Though the Reuters article says that the position wasn't wasn't uh, spelled out in detail to to the media. The U.S.'s position on Rafa. U.S. President Joe Biden spoke on Sunday with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and reiterated his clear position on a possible invasion of the Gaza border city of Rafa. The White House said a statement issued by the White House did not give more details on that part of the conversation. Washington has said it could not support a Rafa operation without an appropriate and credible humanitarian plan. Okay, so Biden said that, uh, that his position on Rafa remains, remains clear. That's what he told Netanyahu, but we don't have any details as to what that position is. An appropriate and credible humanitarian plan is what Reuters is saying. The U.S. cannot support a Rafa operation without an appropriate and credible humanitarian plan. All right. So that is the phone call between Biden and Netanyahu. Basically, it is Biden once again giving Netanyahu a blank check to do whatever he wants. Unless the Biden White House tells Netanyahu, under no circumstances will you invade Rafa. If you invade Rafa, then you will stop receiving money and weapons, which the Biden White House has not done and will not do ever, then basically the Biden White House continues to give Netanyahu a blank check to do whatever he wants. That's how I read this reporting from Reuters, but I could be wrong, but that's how I read it. So we have protests in Georgia once again, in Tbilisi, against the foreign agents law that I believe is coming up for a second vote in the parliament in Georgia. And we had huge protests in Tbilisi, a lot of EU flags at these protests. And once again, this law is very similar to the U.S. FARA Act, where NGOs who are being funded by foreign governments have to register as, as being funded by foreign governments. If 20 or 25%, I forgot the amount, maybe 15% of, uh, of their money is coming from foreign governments, they have to register the fact that they are getting money from foreign governments. Doesn't seem very controversial to me. 
uh, transparency. I would, I would think this is a good thing for NGOs to be transparent about where they get their money from, but the US, the EU, they are not happy about this, this law because what this law does is it exposes these NGOs as being nothing more than foreign agents in Georgia being funded by the EU and by the US to stir up all kinds of trouble in Georgia. That's basically what this law will do. And on the flip side, it will show that these NGOs or NGOs in Georgia really have no Russian influence or very little Russian influence. It will expose the fact that most of the NGOs in Georgia are actually operating under the direction and under the influence of the collective West. And the collective West does not want this transparency to, to come out, does not want this to, to be exposed. And so they are handing out their EU flags to citizens of Tbilisi, and they are heading to the squares in Tbilisi, and they're protesting the enactment, the approval of this foreign agents law. I wonder if these protesters understand that they are actually protesting for corruption, not against corruption. They're protesting for more corruption. But you give them an EU flag and you tell them this is all about EU values and they get out onto the squares and they wave that EU flag and they scream and shout how, how they are against the NGOs having to reveal where their money comes from. <laughs> They're against that. They want their money, where their money comes from, to remain secret. That's right. <laughs> Let's keep our funding sources secret because that's so much better. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Enough of that. Let's, uh, let's hope that this law does pass. I'm for this law. And the more transparent the NGOs are, I say, the better. Why not? We should all understand where the NGOs are getting their money from. Sunlight. Isn't that what they always tell us? Isn't that what the collective West always goes on and on about? Sunlight is the best, is the best thing. It's the best disinfectant. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. Unless, of course, the money is coming from the European Union or the United States. Then, then darkness. Darkness is much, much better. Oh, man. So let's do a couple of more stories before we get into today's clown world. Scotland's first minister, Humza Yusuf, is preparing to resign, according to the Times. Is this true? Is this true? And why is he resigning? I haven't had a chance to to get into this story, to research this story much, but interesting. There was a report yesterday that the U.S. has acquired 81 Soviet-era combat aircraft from Kazakhstan for a total of $2.26 million, which is an average of 19300 per plane. This purchase has sparked speculation about their potential use in Ukraine as decoys or for spare parts. So these planes were put up for auction by Kazakhstan and the U.S. They bought these planes at auction, and I believe that's exactly what they're going to be used for. For spare parts, uh, 19,000 a plane. Obviously, these planes can't function. They're junk. This is junk, but maybe the U.S. wants to, uh, wants to see if they can get some spare parts. For what? So that they can send them to, to Ukraine. That's, that's what this is all about, in my opinion. And an update on Blinken leaving China. Here is a tweet from Yang Lu. Per protocol at MFA China, the foreign minister of China, director for North American and Oceania Affairs, Yang Tao was at the airport to see Secretary Blinken off as he wrapped up his China tour. Yang was also there receiving Blinken 
when he arrived in Beijing. Any assertion of the contrary is false. So the reports, including my report from yesterday, where I said that uh, the only person seeing Blinken off yesterday as he left China was the ambassador of the United States to China is false, according to this post from Yang Liu. And there is a photo, I guess, of of the director of North American and Oceania Affairs, Yang Tao, with Blinken at the airport saying goodbye to Blinken. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. But I don't think that makes the Blinken send off any better, to be quite honest. If 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 uh, the foreign minister of China, if Wang Yi was at the airport seeing Blinken off, then I would say, okay, this is. This is, uh, this is really fake news. The story about Blinken uh, being escorted only by the U.S. ambassador to the airport, then yeah, that is, that is big time fake news if it was the foreign minister of China with Blinken at the airport saying goodbye. But the fact that it's the director of North American and Oceania Affairs, Yang Tao, which is a, a, a high position. I'm not knocking his position. That's that's pretty high up in the government, but still not the same. <laughs> it is not the same as the foreign minister saying goodbye to Blinken. So um, that, is, that is the truth. That is the truth about Blinken leaving China. There was a Chinese official there at the airport. Xi Jinping probably called up the, the foreign ministry and said, hey, uh, who can... Who could take a couple of hours of their lunch break and, <laughs> and uh, escort Blinken to the airport? <laughs> and uh, Wang Yi was probably like, um, hey, uh, director of North, of North American and Oceania, <laughs> and Oceania Affairs. Hey, <laughs> you, uh, you escort Blinken to the airport <laughs> during your lunch break. Oh, man. Anyway, let's uh, let's do a clown world and we can wrap this video up. Reports are that Hollywood director Steven Spielberg is helping direct Biden's campaign. He is very hands on directing the the DNC convention, according to reports, and he's very much involved in directing the Professor Biden election campaign. The filmmaker is reportedly offering his insights on how best to convey the president's successes and his vision for the country to delegates and viewers as Biden prepares to face former President Donald Trump in a November rematch. Stephen wants to be as helpful as possible to the president, a well-placed source told the deadline media outlet. He believes this is one of the most important elections in the nation's history. Yeah, this doesn't surprise me that a Hollywood director is is going to help direct Biden's re-election campaign. Biden's going to need all the all the Steven Spielberg special effects magic that <laughs> that he can get. That's for sure. That is for sure. I'm I'm just not sure if we're going to see I don't know. What are some Spielberg movies? Are we going to see E.T.? Or are we going to see Indiana Jones? Or are we going to see some of Spielberg's more recent movies, which didn't, didn't do too well at the box office? Which Spielberg are we going to see directing Biden's campaign? Anyway, that is the video, everybody. The Duran.locals.com. Come, hello pigeons. How are you doing today? How are you doing on this Monday morning, my pigeon friends? Check us out on Rumble Odyssey, BitChute, and Twitter X, and go to the Duran shop. Pick up some limited edition merch. I will put a link in the description box down below, and. Like this video, share this video, subscribe to this channel. Why should you subscribe to this channel? I'll tell you why you should subscribe to this channel. Because the pigeons 
are saying subscribe to Alex's channel, right, Pigeon? What do you say, Mr. Pigeon? Subscribe to Alex's channel? Yeah? Yeah, you see? You see the pigeons say subscribe to the channel. So <laughs> you should subscribe to the channel. All right, everybody, take care.